And hello, friends. We want to welcome you to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Television. Chapters is the show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in the three states of West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. I'm Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We are pleased to be joined by author Megan Luke today as we're talking about her latest book, The Alternative, a really fascinating book that we're going to get into a little bit later on here on the program today. Megan joins us as the owner and operator of Lukeland Travel. She was uh, educated at the Community College of Baltimore County in Maryland and also a graduate of Ball State University. While she was at CCBM, uh, CCBCMD, she uh, majored in sign language uh, interpretation. She lives in Huntington, West Virginia. She's lived a varied and widely traveled life. Her husband retired from the Air Force. He now teaches ROTC, Junior ROTC at Cabell Midland, and she joins us today on the program to talk to us about her latest book, a fantastic book called The Alternative. So Megan, welcome to the program. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited. So I want to ask you, uh, we were talking a little bit before we started taping about all the places that you've lived as, as being sort of uh, the wife of someone in the Air Force, and, and, and it started in Indiana where you grew up. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that experience and then everywhere that you lived and some of your favorite places that you've lived. Oh, wow. My experience growing up in Indiana? Um, well, there were a lot of cornfields. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I always tell the story. My stepdad, um, we were driving up to Lake Wawasee, if anybody's from Indiana, and um, we were going to a kind of a barn theater thing for Pirates of, the, Pirates of Penzance, and we got lost, and we were in the cornfield fields like in between and they started getting closer and closer and hitting the side of the thing and I had just watched Children of the Corn and I freaked out a little bit and um, I ducked down in the back and I said to get us out of here or something like that and I don't think we ever went back <laughs> because I was a little traumatized but growing up in and Indiana was amazing and I mean way back then a million years ago you know you could just play in fields and stay out till the lights came on and my mom had a whistle if she whistled you knew you were, had to get back home mm -hmm. um, but I always knew that I wanted to be out and go and travel and I still haven't visited the place that I really want to go is Australia um, so that's on my bucket list but uh, yeah as soon as uh, you know I met my husband when I was 17 and we got married the day after my 21st birthday and you know he joined the Air Force after being in the Army and we took off and never looked back. It's been amazing. I really, I really loved being a military spouse. And you, you've been everywhere, Montana, mm -hmm. Louisiana, New Jersey, England, back mm -hmm. to the United States. I mean, yeah. you, you've lived Oklahoma, Oklahoma. Alabama. Um, yeah. Uh, Japan. Yeah. So you, you've covered all, all corners of the globe. Yeah. And so, yeah. and so well, well, welcome to Huntington. We're, we're glad you. to have you and <laughs> glad, to, glad to see that your husband uh, has got that new job as the uh, JROTC -R teacher at Capital Midlands. It's a tongue so. twister. Yes, it is. <laughs> certainly is. Um, I'm really interested uh, in this book because um, you're kind of playing with, in, in the alternative, sort of reality and, and what we define as reality. And tell us a little bit first about what's going on in the reality of the story that kind of makes us see a different reality or follow these characters sure, to a different reality? Sure, sure. So the alternative is a dystopian future where um, the government has decided that to decrease violence, you know, we have school shootings, people running people over with cars and all sorts of violence, drug violence, teen pregnancies, rapes. I mean, we have all sorts of unsavory behaviors um, so the government had decided to put virtual reality gear on everybody and they just wouldn't interact except with their immediate family and um, they're only allowed two pregnancies per family Megan my um, main character has twin brothers so that's kind of how they get away with having more than just two children <laughs> but um, so they interact with their own family and then anytime they go to school or work they have to wear their virtual reality goggles and they're navigated to wherever they need to go uh, if they have a I don't know a maintenance ticket and they have to go someplace to get it fixed then they have their goggles on and they get navigated there and um, really the interaction with anyone is very very you know very small so um, they have um, ration bars and protein drinks that they eat so they don't have to go to the grocery store they have uh, little smocks or um, 
you know, jumpsuits or whatever um, with different colors depending on how old they are. Um, and that is, they don't have to go clothing shopping because they, everything is provided for them. And they work and every job that they do benefits the alternative. So uh, it's sort of a self-sustaining yet not. Um, so that's that's the dystopian reality. Yeah. So where did you get the idea for this kind of a story? Because it's <laughs> it's so it's so multi layered and, and interesting, and it's got so many connections to writers. You know George Orwell's nineteen eighty four, and and a little bit of Isaac Isaac Asimov in terms of you know future technology. And where did you get the idea for this? Well, I will say I hadn't read nineteen eighty four. Um, until after I had written the book and my husband read my book and said, oh, wow, that reminds me a lot of 1984. And so then I read it and I was just amazed because they have sort of um, uniforms and, and things like that too. Um, the idea sort of came to me while I was substituting in the school system and in a classroom. I wasn't a classroom teacher, but I was in a classroom and I had finished the book I was reading and kind of board because you know when someone's taking a test and things like that there's a lot of downtime so I was sort of contemplating how um, every classroom has sort of the disruptive characters whether they are the class clowns and so every time something happens they make a joke or um, get off topic or ask the teacher personal questions instead of questions about the lesson um, or they're eating in the back and not paying attention at all. Well, the kids that are actually there to learn something have a hard time learning anything because of the disruptive behavior of others. And then the teachers are spending a lot of their time um, trying to correct them and get them back on topic. So I'm sitting here contemplating, well, how, how, could, they, how could that be fixed? And um, so my imagination went crazy, and I thought, well, we could put everybody in a little bubble and you know, they, they could just have little pods to learn in. And then I thought, yeah, but then they're in the hallway and they're kicking each other or, you know, breaking up with each other in the middle of the day, which is the worst thing. Like, I don't, why, okay, children, why do you break up with people right in the middle of the day? And then <laughs> someone's crying or just totally unfocused all day. Mm -hmm. Wait till the end of the day. It'll be okay. Two more hours or whatever. <laughs> so somebody's always upset and somebody's being picked on and somebody's, you know, distracted by something. And so I'm like, well, then in the hallways, they don't have their little bubble pods. Well, like we can put virtual reality goggles on them and then they don't even talk to each other. And so that's sort of how it developed. And, um, you know, and then my, I have one daughter in New York and one in Seattle. And I was in New York picking my daughter up and I was looking out the hotel window and there were, um, helicopters flying everywhere and sirens and and things like that and so that just sort of gave me the um, the city aspect of well if you're in this little city or big city but everyone is insulated from each other how would what would that look like yeah, very so, good yeah. interesting yeah. I, and I, I really love Megan who is 17 <laughs> well. when we meet her we talk about <laughs> teenagers and, and their impulsive decisions yes um, tell us a little bit about her and, and you mentioned her twin brothers who we mm -hmm. meet early in the book Tell us a little bit about her first and the kind of relationship she has with those two brothers. Well, I think it's a very typical relationship. Um, she is, like you would expect, someone who has been insulated from everything. She doesn't really think for herself because everything is given to her, provided for her. Um, she, you know, you fill out surveys your whole life about, you know, things you're interested in or things you're good at, and then that determines your job later so really there are no decisions to make and so she is just sort of going about her business and um, her brothers are <laughs> probably the the most interesting thing in her life because they have each other and they bounce off of each other and one is very artsy and one is very technical and so they have these um, you know little conflicts and they chase each other around the room and um, and things like that. So uh, she, I think, kind of is a, a visitor in her own life, and then um, circumstances happen, and uh, she is not a visitor anymore. She has to actually participate and think for herself and, and all that, yeah. Interesting. And she has a really good relationship with her parents, too. This is sort of one of the things that, as I was writing the book, I was trying to decide what the conflict was going to be. And I decided that 
you know, I really love, I have a great relationship with my children, and I love when I see great relationships between parents and children, that really, I didn't want that to be the conflict necessarily, as far as them, you know, uh, you know, I hate you, and go clean your room, <laughs> or whatever, that that really, um, that didn't appeal to me, um, and so I, I wanted the conflict to be other than that. Um, so they have a really strong bond in their family. They um, they understand the idea of teamwork and doing things together, and um, and I I just I like that. I guess. And, yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because you know we see that so often with with dystopian novels or you know, young adult novels yeah. featuring teenagers or you know even younger than 17. There's always an antagonistic relationship with the parents yes. or. One of the main characters likes one of the parents but doesn't like the other. Or the parents yeah. are divorced. Or, you know, there's or all these different. Or a blended family. Or a blended yeah. family. Or they've got <laughs> yeah. the step-parent that they don't like. Yes. Who favors one of the children over the other. Um, but, but you do. You have that core intact family, which is interesting. Yeah. It, it makes it seem more traditional. But, but I think gives balance in the book. Because you've got so yeah. much other stuff going on uh, that there is a sense of normalcy when she right. can relate to her parents and talk to them. So. Well, yeah. And um, I guess the whole, I don't want to give the story. I don't know how much to say. Um most of the conflict happens because they want to continue that bond. They they want to put that family back together when it's um, not necessarily together. So, um, you know, that idea that just because the alternative is a dystopian reality doesn't mean it's an evil dystopian reality. It does have some good, and it really does build up that relationship. And um, they like that reality, but let's make it better. Yeah, kind of thing. Very good. Yeah. Um, one term I wanted to, and you kind of alluded to this already, but one term I wanted to ask you about, um, it really caught my attention in chapter 15 on page 47, the VR unit, okay. letter V, letter R, yes. has a purpose in the story. Tell us what the VR unit is and kind of what it does for Megan and, and, the, and the students that are involved in, in this environment. Sure. So the VR unit, virtual reality unit or goggles, there are many words that we use nowadays for them, and they're really becoming popular in gaming, um, and I guess mostly just gaming, but um, there can be so many more uses for them. And so that's where um, they play a pivotal role, where they um, do keep everyone sort of in this bubble, but that's also the way they learn, too. They um, navigate and everything through that. Um, so, yeah, that's VR unit, Very virtual good. reality unit. Very good. <laughs> and I love it. I love, I love how, you know, it, it it is a always sort of dominating presence throughout the book as the chapters mm -hmm. unfold. You know, it, it's hovering there in the background, but it yeah. does control so much yeah. uh, of what they do and what they experience. Yeah. Well, um, they can even um, change the settings for seasons if they decide they want it to look like winter or mm -hmm. whatever. But then they still get this virtual reality. It's not really winter. They don't feel the cold. They don't smell the snow or the rain um, and hear the sounds of nature and things like that so it's really like it's not really reality yeah, so really. Um, it's, it's what but it's their reality yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's whatever reality they've created or established yes, for themselves yes. very yeah. good i want to ask you too about i just made some notes as i was reading about what do these kids do because they have this vr unit as you mentioned mm -hmm. they can alter the reality the seasons the wet do, do different things yeah. so what is it that they do well I wrote down, and I got to page 189, so I'm not totally finished. But here's I just, I think you should have spent like 10 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if I could have stayed awake, I, I would have. I, if I didn't fall, I should, oh, shouldn't have read sleep. it at night. Shouldn't yeah. have read it at night. Sleep's overrated anyway. Uh, but I wrote down that they, they study, obviously, at yes. school. They can read blogs. Yep. They listen to instrumental music. Yes. They play, no lyrics. No lyrics. Yes. They play one-on-one, yes. -on -one, they play one-player games online. Yes. They can journal, mm -hmm. and they can exercise. Yes. But what I really found interesting was history is censored yes. to support, and, and I just wrote this down, sort of a pro-alternative lifestyle. I think that's actually a quote. Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. good. I wrote that down. I put quotes around that, so I saw that <laughs> yes. somewhere. Pro-alternative lifestyle, yes. why, why is history censored? And I'm going back to the 1984 comparison we talked about. You know, somebody's controlling the That's information true. and what you see. So yeah. tell us a little Except bit about that. Except the information isn't getting out and then it's altered. Um, it just doesn't... So, the, okay, for the instrumental music, let's say. So you've all heard, let's, I don't know, rap music. Oh, it, you know, makes everyone violent or whatever. It's just a generalistic or I guess... Is that even a word? It's a general idea that 
um, certain things evoke certain behaviors. So music with lyrics can evoke um, promiscuity or, I don't know, violent behavior or things like that. So let's just take the lyrics out and you can listen to instrumental music, classical music, um, things like that. Um, hearing about terroristic attacks and things like that may evoke hatred for a certain group of people or things like that and so then they um, want to retaliate or uh, oh well if they attacked this because of that then I have strong feelings about something so now I'm going to attack you know it, it, kind of this domino effect so if you just take out um, the bad uh, and only say see the good then maybe that'll only produce good you know it, I, I guess that was my thought I don't know if it, I who knows if it would actually work that way, but, um, you know, there is a, a point where they go see, like, the 9-11 memorial, mm -hmm. um, the Oculus in New York City, um, where I imagine this story is based. Um, you know, put it in any city and take them to any memorial, and um, you hear about the tragedy that happens. And so what, what, what kind of feelings, um, you know, do you feel after hearing about something like that? Some people are sad, they get depressed, or they get angry. You know, there's so many things. So um, they just don't talk about things like that. Yeah. It's all it, very much STEM-related, science, technology, engineering, math, because that is what will propel the community forward mm -hmm. and um, help it be sustainable. So um, take out those emotions, and what do you have left? Yeah. You know. It, it was really a neat, a neat kind of uh, plot device that you worked in there that really I thought was really interesting. But we do have something that we have to talk about with Megan, and that okay. is she does meet somebody. She meets a stranger mm -hmm. who kind of is outside of this insular world that you've created. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the stranger and that first interaction that stranger has with Megan. Wow. Okay. So... If you imagine yourself in a bubble and you only know your family and then all of a sudden this door opens and you see the eyes of a stranger, well, that is Meredith. And um, I imagine her to just be a fiery ginger, you know, freckles and just uh, she's got a sharp tongue and a, you know, quick wit. So um, but their first interaction is just seeing each other and it's just a second, but it, it's sort of lasting. And then um, later on, uh, Megan and Meredith meet for real, and it's a surprise. Um, Megan is taken off guard, and there's a fight and um, all that. So once the kind of dust settles, and they're actually speaking with each other, I think Meredith is really pivotal in helping Megan develop her sense of self and her own personality. Um, by making her think for herself and um, showing her the world through her own eyes, not these virtual goggles that that she's seen it for her whole life, 17 years. So, yeah. and, and, I, and I love that interaction and how, how Megan is at first not sure yeah. about, about this person and then once she start, once they start talking, and, yeah. and, and we see, you know, there is there is a real world outside of the protected world you're yes. looking at. We see really a, an interesting relationship develop between them. Yes. Tell me a little bit about her parents, and I, I, you mentioned mm -hmm. that that they have a very intact sort of a traditional family, yeah. but something happens to them. They go missing in yes. the story, uh, without giving too much away. I know. Um, I don't know. What to... Why did you have that? I guess I should ask you. Why did you? have that in there um and and how does that change things for megan and her twin brothers when they do get missing well okay so there's a point where her parents go missing but they don't know they're missing yet they think uh the children the um, megan and her brothers just think that they are um, going to kind of be debriefed which is sort of a normal thing after certain experiences and um, they just don't come back and so there's that panic what do we do how do we find them when you all you just have your virtual reality gear on when you leave so you're only seeing what the government or whoever wants you to see so how do you find someone out there in the real world 
when you don't even know what the real world looks like. So the boys, the twins, um, have to go report for debrief as well. So then they're gone, and she's left all by herself. So then, um, yes, she finds herself with Meredith um, out in the on the outside and in a community of people who I would I don't you call them other I guess they're special needs community they I guess in in a place like the alternative they would be seen as not having much value um, someone who is deaf someone who has um, low functioning autism or uh, Down syndrome seizures things like that that oh, what, what do you do with um, amazing people like that that aren't propelling a STEM focused community forward mm -hmm. well you put them in a little community and um, let them you know fend for themselves I guess so she finds herself here um, meeting a young deaf girl and um, you know I have ASL is one of my passions so I was um, really loving adding that element and then um, she learns what cooking is and farming and um, dyeing clothes, sewing, what a patchwork quilt looks like, how to even run a shower because everything is automated in her house. She thinks it's a house, but it's really just an apartment or a pod or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> a small town home. I don't know. So um, that's where a lot of, I think, her, her change happens um, where she really starts thinking about the big picture instead of just what she's been taught for 17 years excellent um, excellent yeah. your writing process oh no how i knew you were it, gonna ask me this. how did it take how long did it take you how did you work on the draft how many drafts did you go through take us through your process for the time from the time you got the idea for this story till the till the book was ready so uh, my process the just, I don't know. So I was sitting there daydreaming about how could this be different, and I jot, jotted down kind of this reality where everybody had the gear on and things like that, but I had no idea what the story was, who anyone was or anything. So throughout, that started in February last year, actually. So in February, I just sort of jotted it down, and I am, I'm an old school, I have to pen to paper. I can't do it on the computer. I, d I don't, my brain doesn't work that way. So I had just a spiral notebook and I just started. And so first I laid out what this community was like. And, um, I had a little diagram of, you know, what the, um, what the, the building would look like that they're in at the end and what their, I don't know, what they would do for fun, what kind of jobs they could have things like that. And so once I had sort of that, I just sort of started writing. I don't know. It's kind of funny. Even the book I'm working on now, my husband laughs at me because I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll say, it made me gasp. Like I had no idea this person was, was that person or I, I had no idea that that would happen. And he's like, how do you know, how do you not know that that would happen? So just once I sort of, I start writing it, just organically, I guess. And if I don't like it, or if I get to a point where I'm stuck, then I take post-it notes and I put, well, if this happened, then da da da, -da would happen. And if that happens, then da da da, -da would happen. And then I choose the one I like the best. It's a choose your own adventure. <laughs> Reminds me of those old scholastic <laughs> yeah, mystery I mean, books, you know? <laughs> if you want George to do this, turn to page 17. If you yes. want George to do that, turn to page 23. And I actually had a couple different endings that I was tossing around and just decided with the one I went with. And maybe later I'll do an alternative ending. Very nice. <laughs> an alternative ending for the alternative. Very good. Yeah. Very good. I don't know. So but, as yeah. you're writing on notebook paper, do you... Do, do you do you, do you just write until you felt like you've gotten through that scene or that chapter? Do you find yourself sort of stopping and going back and editing through as you go? Or how does that process no, work? No, it, it just sort of, it, it goes, it's, a, it's very linear. I really don't go back unless I hit a point where I think, oh, I could foreshadow that. And then I go back to whatever page something happened on and I add maybe a line saying something that relates to that new thing mm -hmm. um 
I think there was one time where I had to go back and completely write, rewrite a paragraph because what I decided in that moment didn't really go with it. It wasn't the it wasn't the same um, alternative, mm -hmm. let's say, lesson pods or something like that. It just I had to go back and say no, nope, this is the decision I make now, mm -hmm. and so I rewrite it. But really, it's just very start to finish. Um, it took me. I started in February. I started editing in uh, typing it in in July, I think, okay. um, June or July, and then um, once I had it all on the computer, I would print it out. Um, and then go through by hand and with a red pen, and then I would edit it, and then I would print it out, and I would go through with the red pen again. And so that's sort of my process. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Who's uh, who are some writers that that you like, or writers that maybe influenced you to write the alternative? Well, I used to work at Borders Bookstore when it was still around in Maryland. I worked there for five years, and I found myself in the young adult section exclusively just about I mean I do the James Patterson's and and things like that but I really um, I read the Hunger Games before everybody knew what the Hunger Games was um, Forest of Hands and Teeth um, by Carrie Ryan I think um, just things like that I'm not really a zombie person and I'm not really a werewolf and vampire person but I don't mind you know if the story is good I don't mind being brought into that I actually, I'm dyslexic, and I didn't enjoy reading for fun until my oldest was born, and I was a stay-at-home mom for the first time. And then I got into Anne Rice, and so I read all the Anne Rice books that she had at the time, and that kind of just brought me into, oh, I can do this for fun, and I don't have to be fast. I can take it as slow as I need to. <laughs> I can go back and read paragraphs if I need to and things like that. So, um, But, yeah, the, the young adult genre is really good okay, for me I, I enjoy it so you mentioned that you were working on another book tell us a little bit yes. about that where are you in no, the process no I don't want you to where steal you? it <laughs> <laughs> um just about over a hundred pages handwritten pages so I don't know what that equates to um into it and it's just starting to get really good in my opinion <laughs> um and it's a parallel universe kind of thing and um that's all I want to tell you because <laughs> I definitely don't want you to give away I too much. <laughs> um, are you going to do a sequel to the alternative? Well, I think I have to, uh, especially since my husband's mad that I left it as a, it's not really a cliffhanger, but I just don't tie up all the loose ends. And so, um, yeah, I, I've been thinking about where I want that second one to go. Excellent. Yeah. Great. I think, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's my baby book. It was my first one, really. I mean, I've started several and then just not really, you know, followed them through. This is the first one I've really started and couldn't let go of until it was done. Um, so I've learned a lot from it, and I look back on it and think, oh, I would do this different or, mm -hmm. you know, things like that, make some creative changes. So I think a second one would definitely um, be important for me to, to be able to kind of make it a toddler book instead of a baby book, <laughs> and then just keep growing. Yeah. That sounds like a good goal to have. So, um, Megan, in our final moments here with you today, sure. if uh, someone wants to get in contact with you to talk about the alternative or to talk to you about writing, uh, how can they get in contact with you, first of all, mm -hmm. and where can they get copies of your book? Well, here at Empire, uh, they have several books on the shelf. Uh, online, you can do the Kindle, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, all that. I'm setting up a, a signing at Books A Million hopefully soon um, within the next month. So all of those online places. Uh, check me out on Facebook for, I think it's just, you know, the whole facebook.com slash um, M. Luke, the alternative. If you Google the alternative in my name, it probably will come up on Facebook. And um, if you want to get a hold of me, that's really the best way. Just send me a, a personal message and I can get back to you. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. Megan Luke has been our guest today here on Chapters. We've been talking to her about her new book, The Alternative, a, a young adult dystopian novel that 
really is fascinating, really creative, really interesting as we follow Megan and her twin brothers through this journey of, 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 of what is real, what is the alternative, uh, and, and who's really going to win out in the end. Will it be the people in the virtual reality, or is it going to be these, these outsiders who influence it? It's, it's a great story. Uh, congratulations to you, Megan. And uh, as you keep writing and keep getting more books published, we'll have you back on Chapters to talk about it. Thanks so much Perfect. for being here. Thank you. We also want to take a moment to say thanks to Chris Dargish and the staff and management of Empire Books and News for providing our on-site support and assistance today. We encourage you to come down to Empire Books and News, pick up a copy of Megan Luke's new book, and also inquire about the other authors, editors, and publishers we have had featured on the program. Many of them have their works for sale right here at Empire Books and News. So come on down to Pullman Square and get your copy of those books here at the store. If you like to interact with us and with social media, we've made it possible for you to stay in contact with the program through a variety of social media platforms. One of the easiest ways to get in contact with us is through our email address, which is right here at the bottom of the screen. It's lp4 at zoominternet.net. We do ask that you please write your name and the town or a community in which you're writing from so that we can keep track of that correspondence. If you like to watch programming on YouTube, we've made it possible for you to follow the Chapters program through the Armstrong One Wire page on YouTube. That address is right here at the bottom of the screen. Once you go to that link, click on the Chapters tab, and we've got all of our author, editor, and publisher interviews archived for you there as well. And if you're a Facebook user, we have a Chapters page on Facebook. That address is right here at the bottom of the screen as well. On the Facebook platform, we have our most recent author, editor, and publisher interviews featured there. Uh, you can like and comment on the programs that you see, share them to your Facebook page, or share them in groups uh, that you're affiliated with on Facebook. And we know many of you have done that, and we appreciate that so much. So if you like email, you like YouTube, you like Facebook, we made it possible for you to stay in touch with the program, interact with fellow viewers of the program, and also share content through one of those social media platforms. So please keep in touch with the program through one of those means. And that's going to do it for us this time on Chapters, but please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community.